Welcome back to City and State TV. I'm Morgan Peckman with my colleague, Herson Barrero. We're here live at the SOMOS 2014 conference in San Juan. We're joined now by the Bronx Borough President and the undisputed stickball champion of elected officials in New York City, Ruben Diaz, Jr. Borough President, thank you so much for joining How us. How are you, Morgan? Hello, Herson. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Now, you were in the assembly. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the chase here. Let's get right to it. You know how SOMOS works. Right. You know some of the good that was intended, but what really has come out of these conferences, for some people, has been a junket, even though there's actual work that I know gets done. I've been one of those critics. This is a very crucial time for politics in general. In the United States, you saw the reshifting, what happened in the Republican majority, all of that. You were co-chair in our state of the governor's re-election effort. He got, no matter what he got, 41% is what the challenger, unknown, with less money than the governor, uh, of a small county out of 62, gets 41% of the vote. How did you guys take that? The, you know, was there a reaction or was just a win enough for the governor who wanted 70% of the vote? Well, first of all, the governor never said, I never heard him say he wanted 70 or 60%. I think that a lot of that was put out by the media in terms of the percentages that his father received. Uh, when you look at, uh, for instance, George Pataki, when George Pataki beat uh, Peter Vallone, and Peter Vallone got in the low 40s, George Pataki got in the high 50s, that was a romp. And this is the same thing that we are experiencing. And, and you have to understand that uh, you have uh, a, a wave throughout the nation. Uh, and they try to infiltrate the state of New York, a wave of, of the conservative right, uh, and they try to infiltrate us or to save to have the New Yorkers say, no, we're not going to allow Bob Astorino here. We're not going to allow for this conservative right to infiltrate our borough, uh, our, our state, uh, and to have the governor win with, with such a large margin, double-digit margin. We'll take that, and I'm so happy that we're going to get four more years of Cuomo. But, but it still doesn't negate the fact that there is a room for an opposition, a solid opposition, and it, it, it doesn't negate the fact that there are some problems within the Democratic Party. C case in point, there was a, a Zafer teacher out of nowhere challenging him and doing really well, an unknown. I'm concerned about you as a good Democrat that you are. Mm -hmm. The governor who has many achievements in his first term much exceeds his father. What's happening in the Democratic Party? Is there a party unconsciously excluding people, Women's Equality Party, which the governor created? Do we need a Latinos Equality Party to be able to be a party? What? You're no, frowning. No, no. I see no, you frowning. No, no, because, because I'm tired of folks trying to put uh, Latinos in a box. I said this in one of the rallies last weekend as we were headed to the final stretch with the governor. When people ask me, Ruben, what is it that Latinos want? You know what I say, Harrison? I say Latinos want what everybody else wants. So when you have a governor that's created half a million new jobs in his first, in his first four years, by the way, a lot of those were in the Bronx. We went in the Bronx alone, thanks to the government assistance, from 13.8% unemployment to 8.5. Life isn't perfect, but five points is nothing to sneeze at. That's what Latinos want. When you have a governor who pushed forward a uh, universal pre-K agenda, that's what Latinos want. When the, when the governor's saying that women should be treated just as equal as men in the workforce and in society as a whole, in the, in the healthcare industry, that's what Latinos want. So housing, I mean, we, we've done over $700 million of affordable housing in the Bronx in the last four years, thanks a large in part with the assistance that we get from the state. The governor has done that, so that's what we care about, safer streets, the New York State Act. That's, that enables a place like the Bronx where you have the only county out of the 62 counties where the largest, where we have the majority of the population Latinos, We're, we are benefiting from that. So we don't need a, a separate party. Now, back to your point about the Democratic Party, what's happening with the Democratic Party. I mean, is it any different than when uh, you looked at the Democratic primary, when Bella Abzug and, and Herman Badillo and, and Percy Sutton and Mario Cuomo and Koch? So what I'm saying is that the Democratic umbrella is such a big one yeah, you're going to get differences of opinion. You have people who are conservative Democrats. You have people who are very progressive Democrats. And then you have everything in between. And that's what makes it so special. So whenever we have that type of debate, that type of discussion, you know, elections are what they are. They're not, they're not about a coronation. They're not about somebody getting 100% of the vote. Uh, and, and, and when it's all said and done, the beauty of Democrats is that we may have differences, but when, it all comes, when we all come together, we, we, we win. And we did exactly that uh, on Tuesday night. 
borough president since the last midterms, we saw a million vote drop off in New York State. I mean, that is absolutely abysmal. To what would you attribute that, that precipitous drop? That's something that everyone, including uh, the folks that are here over this weekend, are trying to wrap our brains around. Uh, it, there are a number of things, however. First, it's not a presidential year. Most people are used to coming out during the pres presidential years. Again, Morgan, if you look historically in uh, midterm elections, there's always been a precipitous drop from presidential year elections. That's number one. Number two, I think that, uh, and this is one of the topics that are being discussed over this weekend, when you when the legislature goes, legislature goes back, they sh we should look and, and examine uh, same-day registration, maybe online voting. We should look at early voting. We should look at uh, closing down the way they do here in Puerto Rico, closing down uh, everything and making it sort of like a holiday, a state holiday so that people can have that opportunity. So I, I think that there are a number, and by the way, um, you know, I would be remiss if I don't say that there are a lot of elect, a lot of people who are turned off by the by the caliber or the quality of leadership. So those of us who are in elective office, I think we have to do a better job of getting our information out, pressing the flesh, talking to folks, not just targeting those who are double or triple prime voters, but those who are actually registered and getting them motivated. So I, you know, I would I would be the first uh, to say that as elected officials, we need to do more of that. But when you look at the decline, it's something that we should not accept. Uh, we should not have a defeatist attitude about and we need to address certain areas and certain issues to make sure that we have larger voter turnout. But you know, we, we hear a lot of elected officials expressing the sentiments that you just did about same day registration and early voting and, and yet nobody in the state legislature seems to be grabbing that bull by the horns, making it their, the leaders aren't making it their signature issue. The governor hasn't proactively made it his signature issue. Now you're not a legislator, so you're not in the position to be able to move that needle yourself. but. Are you gonna? Can you use your influence and and uh, you know your your friendship with the governor to urge him to make that one of his priorities? I I know that the governor has many priorities, and obviously he did that over the first four years. Uh, this is something that we all do need to examine. I've done that with the Dream Act, and now that you can see that there's going to be a, a sense of urgency and, and uh, uh, prioritizing of the Dream Act. Uh, this is something certainly that I will not only urge the governor, but uh, I think he would be open to it. You have to look at what the different uh, legislators are looking, especially in the Senate, especially with a Republican-controlled Senate now. Uh, so we, this is something that we all need to talk about. Uh, it should not be that if we are always touting how great our democracy is, uh, that people are getting elected with very few percentages I mean, of the voter isn't turnout. voter participation, isn't that the core issue in our democracy, it right? Is our government isn't a reflection of the people if the people are not participating in it. And we should embrace it as elected officials. It's not something that we should uh, frown upon or be concerned about. Uh, this is something that we, you know, it works here in places like Puerto Rico where they have 92 percent uh, of the registered voters come out on any given uh, general election. That's incredible, and and uh, we should look to and embrace trying to mirror that. And you know, when we came back from Puerto Rico in September, I wrote a column to, uh, really praising democracy in Puerto Rico and how extraordinarily engaged everyone is here, whether it's a bartender or a taxi driver. I mean, you talk to them, they will give you a discourse, sophisticated discourse on politics. Why is it that we don't have that same investment in New York? Because we don't have that same level of of education on electoral politics or election from very young. Here in Puerto Rico, that, that fervor starts at a very young age. Uh, whether you agree or disagree with a certain party or an ideology, but nonetheless, that's a conversation that's happening regularly. It, it starts at the house, they talk about it in schools. I think that this is something that we should also be talking about with our youth in schools, uh, maybe some civic courses, not just on government, but just getting out to vote and something I've always tried to do as an elected official. One of these days I would like to be a teacher. And one of the things that I go to do is I go uh, to schools and I um, use my position to teach about state government, local politics. Now I don't do it with a, with a partisan twist, but I, I, I show folks, at least through my vantage point and through my experiences, why it matters that we vote and why it matters who is in office. Part of the problem in, in projecting what it is that government, what's good about government, elective office, elections, all of that, that civil responsibility, 
is also that the media, we're constantly reporting on some of the wrongdoings and there's plenty of elected officials abusing their power. How do you deal with that? Is, is it by example of not doing the wrong thing, about doing things by the way? Because there is a, a serious, a cynical approach to what it is where you, you want to be in elective office in order to get goodies for yourself. Case in point, we're having the New York City controller being right now accused of excessive use for his own personal of his uh, of his detail. Uh, Scott Stringer, is, uh, the New York Post has run some stories. Is that, how do you deal with that? That, that you have the reality of, of officials abusing their power uh, the, versus the reality of a civic lesson that you might give as borough president. You were in the assembly. How, how do you transfer that and make it real? Because the kids now are very hip, you know that. You have sons, I have sons, we have people, you know what I'm saying? And they're like, no, 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 what are you talking about? Well, I think since the days of, of very early on, especially during the days of Tammany Hall, it's been, it's been very easy to accuse and to prove uh, corruption and wrongdoing from elected officials. But in my own personal experience, being in the legislature for almost 13 years, being elected borough president for the last five, I have to tell you that the overwhelming majority of elected officials are people who are want to do the best for their communities, are hardworking, are honest, have sacrificed from uh, everything from personal time with their families to some who could really make lucrative amount of salaries in, uh, in the private sector because they want to serve. Uh, what happens is that unfortunately, uh, sometimes in the media, the only thing that is highlighted is when there are bad apples that do bad things, and then that gives us all a, a black eye. So uh, I, I would hope that maybe in the media uh, there could be more of a concentration on when elected officials are doing good work for the community. Somos, the conference. You, you love it, I know you enjoy it, you enjoy it and all, but you enjoy it here, you participate, even though you're not a member of the assembly anymore. What does Ruben Diaz Jr., with the experience, with the experience, this is, this is live. This is a live interview. It's all right, thank you. So, it's okay, but, but, well, it's live TV, what can I tell you? Well, it could happen anywhere. It's, it's happen what happens, I see, well, I see he has fans everywhere. That's right. But, but, <laughs> it's because okay? of the stickball playing. I'm, I'm glad it was a kiss and nothing else. But, <laughs> but, you know, the fact is that you know how the process works. You know what has been expected from the Somos Conference, but what we really get out is very little. From your vantage point, where you don't have to deal with the legislature, what would be real that you come out of here? One, two, or three things that could come and deal with the reality of the new reset in Albany with the majority Senate, with people with different agendas, uh, with what happened at the National World. What would Ruben Diaz Jr. recommend to this conference that they prioritize in Albany next year? Uh, I, that's a very interesting question. I think that, first of all, what you get out of the conference is the reconnection and networking with so many people that you otherwise can't get to speaking to in the city of New York because everyone is busy. That's number one. Number two, uh, you get a real substantive conversation during the day uh, with these workshops. But there are a lot of workshops. Now the question becomes, out of those workshops, which ones you prioritize? I think that what needs to happen is a follow-up, at least with the leadership, uh, to see if, they, if, I mean, over the uh, two, three day span, you have about a dozen different workshops. It's very difficult to put out an agenda with 12 different points, 10 different points. You have to prioritize, do three, four, maybe, Right, we should do white papers on those. Um, maybe then uh, circulate them to uh, those deep members of the legislature who uh, are not Latino or who were not here during this weekend. Maybe right before the, se the, the session uh, begins. Obviously get it down to the second floor, speak to the secretary of the governor, speak to the different commissioners depending on which issues you want to prioritize and, and, then, and then hash it out and, then, and, and convert that into either uh, something that could be codified into legislation or uh, maybe it's something that you need to put into the budget. And, and if you do that with everyone speaking in one voice, remember that we're not monolithic as Latinos. We're not monolithic as Democrats. So you, you, we really have to prioritize see which are the three or four issues that we could all come together, rally behind. And, and I think once you start seeing that, whether it's affordable housing, uh, remember affordable housing, for instance, at least in the Bronx, is not necessarily the low AMI. We do a lot of that, but we also have to retain our professionals. So when you talk about affordable housing, how do we do it in a way where in inclusionary housing, at least in the city of New York, uh, you can include a higher AMI. 
uh, you have the Women's Equality, you have the DREAM Act, you have um, health. Unfortunately, Latinos experience some of the greatest health disparities. You know, I have a lot to brag about in our success in the Bronx. One of the things, unfortunately, that I can't brag about, one of the areas, is the fact that health-wise, we are the sickest county of the 62 counties in the, in the state of New York. So, but even under the umbrella of health, there's so many different issues, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, uh, HIV and AIDS that continues to grow, especially with, um, uh, with women, female Latinas. So these are all the things that the legislators who are ultimately gonna vote on it should maybe confab prior to the session, come out with a white paper, after they prioritize, and, and I think that more and more people start seeing that you can get a lot of substantive work that comes out of this conference. And, and lastly, because Herson's always giving me grief about being a Mets fan, this year I was very pleased to see that your beloved Yankees did very badly. What do they need to do to rebound? We have to go there. We need, we need, we need good pitching. Uh, it's going to be difficult to replace uh, Derek Jeter, obviously when we lost Mariano last year, uh, and we need to, we need to put uh, runs on the board. Uh, we need some bats. Are, are you going to step up? No. <laughs> no, I'm 41 years old, man. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to give up basketball. Uh, I got to start playing golf. And I tried a couple of weeks ago. I'm horrible at it. <laughs> but I got to slow down on my knees. One last right. question before we go. I'm sorry. On, on the governor. Why isn't the governor here? Uh, the, oh, lieutenant gov the lieutenant governor is coming here. Obviously, the governor is had a, a an election that he spent a lot of time away from his family. He's going to spend some time with his family now. He was here with us uh, a, a week. Five and hours, six hours. But it was still, it, it was, it wasn't that. It was the, the, the way he showed respect uh, to the Puerto Rican community and the Dominican community. It went a long way. And when you look at the results, that's why even with all his beautiful Spanish and all of his rhetoric, uh, Astorino did so poorly. I, even with some supporters of his in the Latino community, Astorino did so poorly. I know, and there was community. a certain senator from the Bronx that taught him the Spanish and was praying for him in Spanish. But we'll catch you on the next one. I love uh, you, Bobby. <laughs> uh, leave it to Hurston to ask the substantive question at the end. I come off like the Fox News <laughs> dilettante. <laughs> Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz Jr., thank you so much for joining us. Gracias, Ruben. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you.